Nice to meet you all. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Our question for today. Our question for today in honor of Black History Month and Black Futures Month, uh, would you rather talk to a Black person from the past or a Black person from the future? Tell us why in the chat. Wow. Would you rather talk to a Black person from the past or a Black person from the future? Hmm. My daughter, who is nine, says she'd rather talk to a per Black person in the future because she wants to know if she's rich or not. I guess I can't expect my nine-year-old to be really deep, I guess. But good morning, everybody. As you all are coming in, we have 186 people for today's session, or who signed up for today's session. As you enter to the, um, enter to the nerd session, please introduce yourselves, where you're from. Put it in the chat, please. And our question is, would you rather talk to a black person from the past or a black person from the future and why? Waiting on some more people to come in on this lovely day. I didn't introduce myself when I came in. Sorry. Linda Steet, SUNY Geneseo. Good morning, Miss Linda. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Chantal Browning Morgan. I'm a secondary school teacher in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Hey, Chantal. How are you doing? I'm well, LeGarrette. How are you this morning? Um, I'm doing well. You coming back to Buffalo this summer? I sure am hoping to do so. All right, now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Corinthia Williams. I'm from Magnolia, Delaware, and I am the um, educational liaison for the state of Delaware for juvenile delinquents. Good morning, Ms. Corinthia. How are you doing? I'm fine, and how are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Doing really good. It's Black History Month. It's cold as a Dickens up here in Buffalo, New York, but we're good. We're good. Our question for today, if you could write in the chat, would you rather talk to a Black person from the past or a Black person from the future? And why? Hi, I'm Brian. I'm from the uh, University at Buffalo. Hello, Garrett. Hey, Brian, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good to see you. I was watching something on James Brown, and he was um, he was singing his song, and, and somebody said, oh, you had to be a bad mother. You had white people singing, I'm black and I'm proud. So I was like, hey, you know what? Hey. One of our classics here. All right, about to go ahead and get started. All right, good morning, good morning, everyone. Glad to uh, see everyone's here. Um, today, I want to uh, say happy Black History Month from the University of Buffalo Graduate School of Education Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Literacy Education. Uh, we are so delighted for your support uh, throughout the year um, where we read and learn and research and write and teach and love and live Black history um, all day. So we really, really appreciate you all uh, from me, um, uh, Donovan, Greg, and Montana. Uh, we we thank you uh, from, from the bottom of, bottoms of our hearts uh, for supporting us uh, throughout uh, the year. We hope to see you this summer at our sixth annual Teaching Black History Conference, which will be Sounds of Blackness, Hip Hop Turns 50. 
Happy Black History Month from the Association for the Study of Life and um, African American Life and History, whose theme for two, 2023 is Black Resistance. And what's interesting about resistance is, is that at the core and at the heart of um, you know, black histories, our aspects of resistance is key to our survival, and so uh, we really um, you know promote all the the activities during this month um, that focus on aspects of black resistance. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, so thank you for for uh, coming and happy Black History Month for our um, first one, first Black History Nerds during Black History uh, Month. So thank you for coming uh, back. Um, also with our Teaching Black History Conference, which is um, in July, July 21st through, through the 23rd, Sounds of Blackness, Hip Hop Turns 50. If um, Greg Donovan or someone could please put the link um, to our website that focus, that, that uh, centers the Teaching Black History Conference. So right now we're taking uh, proposals, right, uh, to present at the conference. If you have any ideas around any Black history topic, it doesn't have to focus on hip hop or rap or music or anything like that. It can focus on any form, um, any topic around Black history. We would definitely appreciate it. Um, typically, we have around 50 presenters over three days. And uh, this year, the registration is going to be around 120, and you can't beat that uh, for three days worth of great learning, all right? It's, it will be hybrid, and we have come with a plan to make our hybrid experience a little better, all right? So please, if you have any, any ideas around teaching Black history, this is the conference that convenes hundreds of educators from around the world um, to come in to, to learn about the best practices of Black history education. Today is uh, Rosa Parks Day, uh, February 4th. I believe this was her birthday or close to it. Uh, so a few states um, uh, celebrate Rosa Parks Day. So for our research, our resource of the week, um, uh, we have um, The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks. Uh, we have the book as well as the documentary, which is on Peacock. Right. So if you have an opportunity to, um, you know, read and look at um, the rebellious life of Rosa Parks, it's it's great. Right. And it serves as a really good resource for um, your classrooms, um, particularly as we push back of the tire seamstress narrative of Rosa Parks. Great, great individual, great human, um, you know, as well as an activist. All right. So this this is our resource of the week. Um, next week, February 11th, we have Dr. Amanda Vickery coming in. Um, hands that pick cotton now pick public officials, the Black women's geography and activism of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and of course, uh, please sign up um, and register for that, and we will see you all next week. But today, we have From History to Destiny, What Does It Mean to Be Black? Dr. Uh, Shika Akua. Uh, from Clark Atlanta University and all the other things that he does. And, and I'm sure he's going to, you know, talk about all those particular aspects. So before further ado today, you know, of course, you all haven't um, uh, signed up to hear me talk. So um, I'll definitely pass it along, have him introduce himself, and then go ahead and get started. And, you know, any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Greg and Donovan in Montana, they'll they'll curate those um, particular questions, uh, particularly if you don't want to wait towards the end. All right. Any conversational pieces you can put in the chat as well, and we'll try to um, you know respond to them later. All right. So before further ado, Dr. Kua, welcome to Black History Nerds. We're just a bunch of nerds on Saturday morning that learn Black history, and I'm your HNIC. So thank you, sir. Welcome to our feature nerd for today. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a blessing to be here. Uh, anytime I can be in the presence of educators, uh, because at my core, um, that's all I am. Is I, I'm a teacher. Um, uh, I always like to begin with what time it is. Uh, a great African-American uh, scholar by the name of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays said it's 1159 on the clock of destiny. And life is like a minute. Only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon you can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to you to use it. 
You'll suffer if you lose it. Give account if you abuse it. It's only a minute, but eternity is in it. And with that minute, you, me, and we can change and transform the world. Uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to be on here. And when Dr. King sent me the invitation, I was very excited because I had uh, seen some things that he was doing online. And um, So let's get right into it. I want to first bring you greetings from Clark Atlanta University, um, one of our great HBCUs where I'm honored to serve on the faculty in the Department of Educational Leadership. Um, I also wanna bring you greetings from the Teacher Transformation Institute, where we use standards-based, research-driven, culturally relevant instructional strategies to increase student achievement. Now, those are just some big sounding words to say that our children are brilliant, but many of them are in schools and school districts where they're seen as a problem rather than as people. And so we go into districts and we provide professional development, culturally relevant materials, large group instruction, online curricula, social emotional learning focus groups, strategic planning and model teaching lessons. And we have all sorts of uh, wonderful team members who provide support in what area, whatever area is needed in that particular school or district. Um, these are people, as you look at these pictures, they work with very diverse groups of educators and leaders, and these are the ones that have had the Akua experience or the teacher transformation uh, or the leadership unlimited experience. Um, and we enjoy, you know, working with teachers and leaders. Um, and what we found is that when they receive the right kind of, of training, then they're excited to go and reach our children. Okay. Uh, we work directly with students as well, uh, because one of the things that I found is I didn't want to be one of those professors uh, that would come in and provide professional development who had not been with children or seen children in a long time and couldn't relate to what I was going through as a teacher. I spent 14 years as a middle school teacher. Uh, also had some experiences on the elementary and high school levels as well. Um, I'm going to be sharing some information that you may want to share. So have your phone ready or be ready to take some screenshots. I feel confident that you're going to want to see some of these things. Uh, so, you know, feel free to, to post what you see and tag me on it. We'd love to see it. All right. Uh, it's always good to see a, a, a running narrative of how people respond to the information that we share. So definitely feel free to do that. I want to encourage you to do that. All right. So we're going to talk about from history to destiny. What does it mean to be black? From history to destiny, what does it mean to be black? And I'm, I'm asking this question, what does it mean to be black? Because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about what it means to be black. And I think we're in need of a radical redefinition and reevaluation and reassessment of what it means to be black. It's customary when African people come together that we begin uh, by giving honor to our ancestors because there's an African American, or there's an African proverb which says, if we stand tall, it is because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. Or as Dr. Jacob Carruthers has said, indeed, our stride is wide because we're walking in the footsteps of giants. One of the giants in whose footsteps I'm attempting to walk and on whose shoulders I'm endeavoring to stand tall is none other than Dr. Asa Hilliard III, uh, just a, a, a monumental African educator, just a tremendous person. If you're not familiar with him, you definitely want to familiarize yourself with him. I'm going to be speaking from the context of two of my books today. First one, Education for Transformation, Keys to Releasing the Genius of African-American Students, and Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success. All right. Um, this is a very visually driven presentation, and you've heard it said before that a picture is worth a thousand words, but you're going to have to look with more than just your physical eyes. You're going to have to look with what ancient Africans called the ujat. The ujjat is the eye of all seeing enlightenment, the eye of intuition. Some people call it the third eye, but it's really the first eye, the eye of intuition that allows us to see beyond the physical realm and into the mental and spiritual dimensions. Even as the great poet Lister Bell Middleton said, sharpen your eye and tune your ear so you know what you see and understand and what you hear. Now, uh, before I get into it, I must give you a warning. You are in a danger zone. This presentation has been specifically designed to blow your mind. And, and I share that with you up front because I want to know when you're having these different emotional reactions to what I'm about to share with you. I've had the opportunity to share what I'm about to share with you all over the country and even internationally. 
And the response is always great shock and awe at what we have not learned about history uh, once it's presented to us, all right? So don't believe a word I say though, do your own research, okay? So let's get into it. I wanna take you back to a time when black people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production and wealth creation. Hold up, time out, we stop right there. Most people, teachers and students and parents and leaders are not aware that there was a time when black people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production and wealth creation. But let's go ahead and get into it. My presentation is broken down into sessions. Each session is maybe about 10 minutes. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll do some Q&A. But session number one says, who were the ancient Kemites and what did they look like? Who were the ancient Kemites and what did they look like? We know that all life on planet Earth began deep in Central Africa, where that big red arrow is pointing near Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania, all right? And, one, and the original names tell the whole story. One of the original names of Africa was Al-Kibulan. And Al-Kibulan means land of the spirit people. Why land of the spirit people? Be, because we brought spirit to everything that we did. We brought spirit to reading and writing and language and literature, uh, architecture and engineering, agriculture and uh, astronomy, mathematics and medicine, science and technology. We brought spirit to all of that, but now we live in a society that attempts to despiritualize us. And so we have to be very careful about the schooling process that it doesn't despiritualize our children. As a matter of fact, in the research literature, they talk about spirit killing amongst black children in schools, that, that the curriculum and the instruction is meant to kill the spirit rather than uplift the spirit of the children. Something to think about. But the original names tell the whole story. What we today call Sudan in ancient times was called Nubia. What we today call Egypt in ancient times was called Kemet. And what we today call Ethiopia in ancient times was called Kush. Now, Dr. King, I don't know about you, but years ago, I was not aware that there was another meaning for Kush. I was down in Alabama. Uh, I spoke at Tuskegee University. They, they loved the presentation so much. They asked me to go to nearby Booker T. Washington High School, give a presentation. So I'm speaking to about two or 300 high school students. And when I got to this point in the presentation, they all fell out laughing when I said Kush. And I said, that I, I didn't know I said something funny. What, what, what was so funny? They said, well, Dr. Cool, when we say Kush, we're referring to weed, you know, to marijuana. I said, isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that somebody took the name of your sacred holy homeland and turned it into something that'll get you locked up, turned it into something that'll get you locked down? Then I asked the audience, how many of you all know, and these were all black students, I asked them, how many of you all know somebody who's locked up? Well, of course, almost all the hands went up. And then, you know, I, I also hearken back to um, my presentation at the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics when I, I offered them the opportunity to engage in a research project. I don't know if anybody's ever taken me up on it yet or not, but I asked them to look up the number of, of, of African-Americans who have been arrested for possession of marijuana and compare that to the number of new white millionaires in the cannabis industry. Yeah, it got quiet there too. Wow, man, isn't that interesting? It's the same thing that, that Black people were getting locked up for decimating our families and communities. People are now making, it's, it's the, one of the fastest growing industries in America. Interesting. But then we also had to take it to science class because do you know that all the chemicals that you need to get high are already in your body? We just haven't been taught the African sacred science of how to trigger the release of those chemicals. Otherwise, you could be high all the time. I'm, I'm high right now, you know, but I, but I haven't been smoking. All I've been doing is drinking my water. All right. And so uh, these original names tell the whole story. The entire Nile Valley of Africa was a high-tech civilization, okay? And, and all of these were great empires. One of the empires that did the best job of preserving the knowledge of the entire Nile Valley was Kemet, or what we today call Egypt. And in Kemet, we have the, the best documentation 
of what was going on in the region. And so I want to focus in on there for a little bit. My friend Anthony Browder has written the book Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, and he shows us the original uh, construction of the word Kemet in the original language of Medu Necher. Most people look at this and they would say that's hieroglyphics. Well, hieroglyphics is a Greek term, and this is not Greek writing. The original term is Medu Necher. And here we see the word Kemet written out in Medu Necher. Now, they did not use vowels the way that we use vowels today. Scholars will come along later and add vowels for ease of pronunciation. But here we see the charred or burnt piece of wood that represents the K and the M sound. We see the owl that also represents the M sound. We see the bread loaf that represents the T sound. This by itself means black, everybody. This by itself means black. Now in metanature writing, you have what's called a determinative. And a determinative determines what the rest of the word was referring to. So at the bottom of your screen, it says this by itself means black, but X with a circle around it means nation. So what does that mean together? Black nation. Everybody, I promise you, you're not going to see this on the History Channel. I promise you, you are not likely to see this in public school textbooks because of the falsification of who the ancient Egyptians were. We've all seen movies, uh, documentaries, even cartoons that depict the ancient Egyptians as anything but black. And so I want to give you uh, some, some things to consider. I had to go back to make the point and choose some statues and pictures, uh, statues of ancient Africans, and put them alongside of modern day African Americans to approximate their appearance so that you could see what these people really look like. And then we'll talk about what they did. Now, I'm just approximating the appearance here. So, for example, when I look at King Mentuhotep, and I look at the face, I look at the, the nose, the lips, I said, man, he looks, he looks a little bit like LeBron James. Hmm. And then when I look at the face of King Amenhotep III, take a look at the high cheekbones, the nose, the lips, I said, man, he looks a lot like a, a, a former NFL player by the name of Adrian Peterson. And again, we're just approximating the appearance here. Take a look at Queen T here, the fame of the famed 18th dynasty of ancient Kemet, who ruled alongside her husband, Amenhotep III. Now, I don't know if you've seen this particular picture before, but you have seen this face many, many times before. You just didn't know what you were looking at. So take a careful look, because in looking at the face of Queen T, you didn't know that you were really looking at the face also of former First Lady Michelle Obama. Again, we're just approximating the appearance of who the ancient Kemites were and what they look like. When I see the profile picture of King Khafre, I say, man, I've seen that face. before. Where have I seen that face before? Oh, he looks a lot like Kobe Bryant. Interesting. And what about Amenemet? King Amenemet. Take a look at the, uh, the nose, the, the wide nose, the thick lips, even though it's been chiseled off, the, the nose. And the, the locks, you know, in my next life, I'm going to have some locks like that. But right now, I'm part of the bald head brotherhood. And I got to rock what I got. But when I saw this picture of him, I said, man, he looks an awful lot like uh, Dante Robinson. He used to play defensive back for, uh, for the Atlanta Falcons. And so it's interesting. When I look at the, the face of Queen, Queen Amenertes, I see Lupita Nyong'o. When I look at the face of King Narmer, look at the high cheekbones, the nose, the eyes, the lips bears a striking resemblance to the gospel singer, Kirk Franklin, okay? Uh, let's go a little further. Take a look at King Simwosret. King Simwosret, when I saw this, I said, man, he looks a lot like the actor Mahershala Ali. Interesting. Now, here's the challenge that I have, Dr. King. When I look at us, I see kings and queens. But the way our children have been socialized through miseducation and skillful media manipulation, they see themselves as niggas and bitches. Please forgive my language. Just trying to make it plain and keep it clear. Again, I see kings and queens, but they see themselves as the N word and the B word as a result of miseducation and skillful media manipulation. So now these um, images that I've shown you are just to approximate the appearance. But let's dig into the science 
with one of our greatest scientists, Dr. Shekanta Diop, from out of uh, from Senegal in West Africa. He was a historian, linguist, physicist, anthropologist, political scientist, and activist, multidisciplinarian, who came up with twelve areas of empirical evidence to demonstrate that the ancient Chemites were indeed Black people. One of those areas was called the melanin dosage test. You know, melanin, the, the substance that's in our skin that gives it its rich pigment. Well, most science books don't teach anything about melanin for, in, in public schools. But interestingly, he said, if you will give me access to the royal mummies, he went to the, the Louvre Museum in Paris where they had the stolen mummies. And he said, if you will give me access to the royal mummies of Kemet, I can prove scientifically that they were in fact black people. I would take a skin sample from the mummy. I would put it in a solution of ethyl benzoate, put it under my microscope. And when you shine a light on it, it causes the melanocytes uh, to become fluorescent. The melanocytes are the cells in the skin uh, that hold the melanin. And you can literally count the number of melanocytes to determine what the skin tone of the person is. They refused to give him access to the mummies. But for two years, he was unrelenting, and they finally gave him access to the mummies. Take a careful look at this picture of Dr. Sheikh Anta Diab, because that's going to be important. Because in his research findings, here's what he said. They were black, black, more black than I. But here's where it gets really deep, everybody. I have found that many other people have done the same research before me, but they never published their findings. The reason I know this is because I found that the skin of many mummies had been completely scraped. You would be amazed at the great lengths people will go to to make sure that our children do not know the truth about history. And that's another reason why I'm so excited to be a part of the Black History Nerds this morning, all right? So that was session one. So now that we see who the ancient Chemites were, what did the ancient Chemites accomplish? Uh, now that we see what they look like, well, we can start with Imhotep. Imhotep was the first recorded uh, doctor in human history. He was the architect of the Step Pyramid, mathematician, advisor to king, uh, to the king, Zoser. He was a multidisciplinary genius. Um, I like to lead trips to, uh, to Egypt. I've had the opportunity to leave over 1,000 young people and adults on these trips. And so I do primary on-site research, right? So every time you see one of these pictures with my face on it, replace that face with your face, because hopefully at some point you'll be able to go back and see it for yourself, all right? So here we have a picture of, uh, of the Great Pyramid. And I want to stop for just a second here. Which of the, the largest pyramids in this picture, A, B, or C? Which one do you think is the Great Pyramid? Would you put it in the chat box? A, B, or C? A would be the one on the left. B would be the one in the middle. C would be the one on the right. Would you just drop it in the chat box? Which one do you think is the Great Pyramid? Thank you so much, Jerry Johnson. All right, Elizabeth, Benjamin, Brian, Chantel, Ramana, Dory. Wonderful. I see all the answers coming in. Great, great, great. All right. So a lot of you were actually like me. Prior to going to Egypt, I always thought the one in the middle was the Great Pyramid. However, I discovered that it's actually C, the one to the far right. And what I noticed uh, later on is that the one in the middle appears to be the largest, but it's actually closer to the camera. And if you look over here in the bottom right, it's sitting on higher ground. Okay. So the Great Pyramid is actually three, uh, 481 feet high, covering an area of 13 acres. It is absolutely massive. The only one of the wonders of the world that is actually still standing. Interesting point. Uh, it's 201 stair steps to the top. It's, it, it's absolutely amazing, okay? Uh, let me get back in here to my PowerPoint. All right, there we go. And so here we see the Ams Mathematics Papyrus. This is the oldest math textbook in the world. Um, it contains uh, 80 math problems. It's known to be almost 4,000 years old, okay? 
but it's also known to be a copy of an older African text. Now, how do we know that? Why? Because the writer almost says this is a copy of an older African text. But if you can't read the, the writings of your ancestors, then you're at a loss. But this portion of the uh, papyrus contains examples of algebra, trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, square root, area, circumference, volume, and much, much more. It also includes the scientific method in the preface where the writer almost says that this is the correct method of investigating all things in order to know all things that exist, each mystery and every secret. Wow. Was that in any of your math or science textbooks? Interesting. Now, as I mentioned, it's 481 feet high. And to give you an idea, in ancient times, it was covered in polished white limestone with a capstone of pure gold and silver. That mixture is called electrum. Later on, Arabs would come and chip away uh, the polished white limestone and the gold to build their mosques in the city of Cairo because they didn't understand or appreciate the culture. And one of the things I always teach my students is no one will understand or appreciate your culture unless and until you do. So as you can see, it's 481 feet high. But to compare that and put it in perspective, the Statue of Liberty is 151 feet high. You could put it on top of itself three times and it still wouldn't be as high as the Great Pyramid, okay? I also want you to know that one of the lies that we've been told is that the pyramids were tombs. There are pyramids in Sudan that are tombs. Matter of fact, there are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. Those pyramids are tombs. These pyramids are not tombs. This is where ancient Africans were studying the sacred sciences and where they were calculating the procession of the stars. There are actually passageways that are perfectly aligned to different stars and star systems. And so they would use this as astronomical observatories to calculate uh, the calendar and different things of that nature. All right. So now we've gone from the Nile Valley of Africa to Washington, D.C. in America. Take a careful look at this picture. Lincoln Memorial. Everybody's seen this. Many of us have been to D.C. and actually been to the, to the memorial. But when you went, did you know you were looking at an exact replica of Pharaoh Ramesu? The Greeks called him Ramesses. And you can say, well, come on, Dr. Kuhl, that's that's just a coincidence. Well. When I take you to the Temple of Abu Simbel, what you'll see is not one, but four colossal statues of Ramesu. One was destroyed uh, by an earthquake, but four colossal statues of Ramesu, four colossal statues. When you walk in between these uh, statues, you come to the door of a temple, and something amazing happens inside this temple. The sun shines a beam of light down this corridor and lights up the face of the king only two times a year, on the day of his birth and on the day of his coronation. Now I ask you, what kind of mathematical, architectural, engineering, astronomical mastery did these ancient Africans have to have to orient a temple in that way? When we go a little bit further, we find also that this temple was not built from the ground up. It was actually carved out of the side of a mountain. In other words, they dug into the mountain, chipped away all of the excess rock. You thought these things were statues here. Uh, these are actually pillars holding up the structure as they were chiseling away. So they got rid of the excess rock and, and then designed the temple carved in the writings of the Medu Netra from floor to ceiling and even on the ceiling, but also note this. Remember, we said there are four colossal statues of Ramesu. Where have I seen hmm, four faces carved into the side of a mountain? Where have I seen that before? Wow. Did you know the founding fathers of America studied African history very thoroughly because they wanted to build a nation as great as ancient Kemet. And they knew they could not do that without African people, not just through slavery, but African knowledge, very important distinction that needs to be made. They were after African knowledge and used a great deal of it. 
And it's even replicated on the back of the dollar bill where you see uh, the pyramid and the all seeing eye and different things of, of that nature. Here we have the Washington Monument, tallest structure in Washington, DC. But where do you think the design came from? If you said ancient Kemet, you're absolutely right. Which is interesting that they would memorialize George Washington, who owned African people as slaves, but they use an African symbol of strength and stability to memorialize him. Interesting. I took this picture of this uh, uh, monument. The ancient Africans called it a Tekken. The Greeks called it an obelisk. But I took this picture with the sun rising behind it because, among other things, it was used as a sundial. You could tell what time of day it was by the way the sun cast a shadow and the casting of the shadow would act as the hands of a clock. It's interesting when you talk about African technology, people are like, huh? like well, that's, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with modern technology? Well, the word technology comes from the Greek word technos, and the Greek word technos comes from the ancient word tekken, right? So here we see the Washington Monument in front of a reflecting pool. Imagine in my amazement, when I get to the temple of Amun-Ra, and what do I see? There's a reflecting pool, and there's a Tekken. Wow. As Ashra Kwesi said, man, somebody knew something about us that we didn't even know about ourselves. Because our history was intentionally kept from us. Our history was intentionally kept from us. I'm going to stop right here for just a moment. I, I just I need some adjectives or phrases, some brief adjectives or phrases just based on what I've shown you so far. Throw it in the chat box. Give me some adjectives or phrases based on what I've shown you thus far. Did you already know this? Was this interesting to you? Was it shocking to you? Was it surprising to you? Go ahead and throw it. Oh, wow. Okay, check it out. Dorinda says, still working on keeping the history from us. Jerry says, enlightening. Jerry also says, mind-blowing. Shelby says, amazing, powerful, empowering. I'm looking at all amazing, astounding, empowering. Do you think our children should know this? Yes or yes, put it in the chat box. It's okay if you want to say no, but put it in the chat box. <laughs> Janet said, I spun around like four times in my kitchen. Yeah, keep your eyes on the screen. It's, it's about to get even deeper in just a minute, Janet. But yeah, do you think our children should know this? All right. I'm seeing yes, absolutely. Children need, need to know the African origins of modern civilization. Yes, 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 says Zanita. Thank you so much. Jerry says, Lord have mercy. All right. Yeah, it's imperative. I agree. It is imperative. All right. So let me go back because what I want to share with you is I want to share with you um, another connection. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about reading Revolution Online because as a teacher, uh, we need resources and that's what I'm about. So uh, we're going to have a good time while we're here, but when you leave here, you need resources. And one of them is Reading Revolution Online. So you can go to readingrevolution.org to learn more about that. I'm going to play you something uh, from it, but I'll, I'll go ahead and put something in the chat box for that right now. All right. So it's reading revolution.org. All right, so you can check that out. Um, one of the other things that I want you to be mindful of is the intentionality behind covering up the truth about uh, our history and culture. This is something all children need to know. But you know, over the years in doing these presentations, I've had some people say, well, this is really interesting, Dr. Kua, but African-Americans were taken from West Africa, not East Africa. I said, well, it's not incorrect, but it is incomplete. And so that leads to session three. Session three, we asked the question, um, give me just a second to get my PowerPoint back up. But in session three, we asked the question, what is the relationship between African-Americans, East Africans, and West Africans? So bear with me for just a moment. Uh, Give me just a second here. We're going to get it together. All righty. Uh, PowerPoint is locked up, but that's not going to stop our show. Just bear with me for just a moment. 
Um, you can check out the website while you're waiting if you want, readingrevolution.org. And we're going to get right back to our regular, regularly scheduled program. There we go. All right. I'm not going to stop our show. All right. So what is the relationship between African-Americans, East Africans, and West Africans? All right. You know, when uh, when all these great and wonderful things were happening in the Nile Valley, once it was invaded and inundated uh, by Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Arabs, there were six mass migrations out of the Nile Valley of Africa to West Africa. But the people brought their culture with them, and they set up the great empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhoi. All right? And so what you see is the remnants of ancient Kemetic culture in these West African empires. As a matter of fact, this past summer, I was installed as a chief in the Isabel region of Ghana because they're putting their history back together and they know that they're the descendants of ancient Kemites. And so they have uh, asked me along with some other African-American scholars to assist them in that process because just like we've been miseducated here as a result of slavery, they were miseducated on the continent as a result of colonization, okay? And so I want to share with you Reading Revolution as a way of bridging this gap uh, and helping us to understand how we can now share this information with our students. So let me take you back a number of years to when I was a language arts teacher, and I used to always infuse this kind of information into my classes. Uh, and then I became a reading specialist. And while I was a reading specialist, they sent me all the students who had not passed the state test in reading. Uh, no problem, you know, I can bring them up to speed. But they said, Mr. Kua, we don't have a curriculum. I said, no problem, uh, because I've always developed my own curriculum. I rarely, if ever, taught from the curriculum resources I was given to teach from because it didn't meet the needs of the students. So every day I would do a brief write-up of a uh, Black hero or shero, ancient or modern from our history, a brief reading selection with 10 multiple choice questions. And every day we would do one of these because I wanted the, those reading selections to mimic what my students would see on the state test. Only difference is the content was about their history and culture, all right? Well, over the years, we developed all those together and made a book called Reading Revolution. But in 2018, we began digitizing all of that content and we created Reading Revolution Online. It's a collection of 90 reading selections, 90 captioned videos, and then vocabulary, uh, comprehension, grammar, and writing activities to go with each one. So we left off talking about West Africa. I want to share some information with you about West Africa. I'm flipping through the different selections in Reading Revolution, and we're going to come to Ahmed Baba, all right? Now, let me go out and make sure that my, uh, that my sound is on, okay? I'm going to play a three-minute video for you, and then we'll start to wind down, uh, but I'm going to play a three-minute video, but while you're watching this video, I want you to remember this African proverb, books are worth their weight in gold. Books are worth their weight in gold. And what I would like for you to do is I want you to be thinking about the books that you love or like that you highly recommend, all right? Uh, but again, this, this video is just under three minutes, and let's have a look, all right? Ahmed Baba and the University of San Uh Dr. King, can you give me a thumbs up if you were able to hear that? Yes, sir. I got you. Thank you so much. Ahmed Baba and the University of saint Corre. From the 1300s to the 1700s, Timbuktu was one of the greatest cities in all of Africa. Situated near the Niger River, this great center of learning was known throughout the land. It was also an important trading center for gold, salt, iron, and books. Timbuktu had quite a reputation for educational excellence and wealth. So much so that students and scholars came from all over Africa, Asia, and Europe to study at the famed University of Sankore. 
Being near the river gave people easy access to this thriving city of trade and education and attracted many people. Ahmed Baba was the president of the University of Sankare for 30 years. During this time, he upheld the African standard of excellence, running the university with great vision. Also during this time, he authored 42 books. This means he wrote more than one book per year in addition to his duties as president. Additionally, Ahmed Baba had over 1,600 books that he owned in his personal library. This shows that he knew the power of books to transform the mind. To Africans who introduced the art of writing to the world, books were sacred and holy. Books were valued so much that people paid for books using only gold. The book a person desired to purchase would be placed on one side of a scale and gold dust would be sprinkled on the other side of the scale until the scales were balanced. Books in Timbuktu and in the empires of Mali and Songhai were literally worth their weight in gold. Because of this, the book industry was just as lucrative as the gold, salt, and iron industries. People who studied at Timbuktu learned law, medicine, and healing, writing, and literature, astronomy, the study of the stars, and agriculture, the study of farming, and much more. They took their knowledge and understanding of what they learned back to other parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Some even came to America. History also shows us that virtually every home in Timbuktu had an extensive library of books and manuscripts. All right, I'm going to stop that right there. If you learned something new, would you put that in the chat box? What, what did you hear in that that you may not have already known? What did you hear in that that you may not have already known? Anything new? or that you think our children should know? Drop it in the chat box. And let's see, let's see, Kurt says most definitely. Elizabeth said, I had no idea the value placed on books, right? Mary, books were worth their weight in gold and people from around the world went to study at this place. Yeah, Mary, you know, it's interesting. When I was growing up, we had a saying, man, I'll knock you all the way to Timbuktu. I didn't know that was an actual place much less one of the great learning centers of the world where people came from all over Africa, all over Asia, all over Europe to study from these brilliant Africans. And when they got there, they didn't see those Africans. Uh, they didn't refer to them as the N word or the B word. Very interesting. So one of the things that my teacher, Dr. Hilliard said, he said, whatever you do, don't let them start our story in slavery. You never start a people's story at their lowest point. And if you do that, you leave out thousands upon thousands of years of African excellence. And so I had to completely re-educate myself as a teacher because none of what I have shared with you, none of it did I learn in my bachelor's degree program, in my master's degree program, or in my doctoral program. You can go from from, from preschool to post-doctorate and learn nothing about the truth of this history and this culture. And so I implore each of you to be willing to go on that journey to do that, okay? Now, as I mentioned, a lot of what I was sharing uh, was can be found in my books, uh, Education for Transformation, and my book, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations. So give me just a second because I want to tell you the difference between the two. Education for Transformation is the book that shares the teaching methods, the teaching methods that master teachers use uh, to reach uh, African-American students, okay? And then I uh, wanted to ask, is there one essential reading of Dr. A.C. Hillier we should read? Seba, The Reawakening of the African Mind. Seba is spelled S. B A. Saba, the reawakening of the African mind would be uh, the book that you want. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, 
the African mind. Whoops. He also has a book called The Teachings of Patahotep, the oldest book in the world, which is the oldest complete text in the world is Teachings of Patahotep coming out of the Nile Valley of Africa. Outstanding texts. Um, so thank you for that question. All right. One of the things that I want to share with you, I mentioned Education for Transformation shares the methods master teachers use to reach African-American students and all students, okay? Honoring our ancestral obligations would be more for those that teach high school, college, for high school and college students and those that teach and lead them, okay? Both of those books have a QR code at the beginning of the book, which when you scan it leads you to uh, 15 brief videos sharing key concepts in the book, okay? But let me go back to Reading Revolution for just a moment. If you could have access to Reading Revolution, would you want access? Do you think your children, your students would enjoy and that you would enjoy utilizing Reading Revolution? We didn't even get a chance to look at the activities that go along with each of those videos and reading selections. But if the answer is yes, would you put that in the chat box? Because I just want to see who's interested. I know some, some are interested because somebody's already logged into Reading Revolution. But as I'm scrolling down, I'm seeing a lot of yeses, most definitely. Okay, got something for you, all right? Uh, we're running a special now where you can have free 30-day access to Reading Revolution online. Yeah, but come on, Dr. Kua, what's the catch? There's got to be a catch. There is a catch, but it's real simple, and it's something everybody can do. We're gathering data, right? And so in order to gain access, free 30-day access, to Reading Revolution Online, all we ask that you do is fill out this brief survey, which will literally take you less than two minutes. We're just gathering data to learn more about those that are interested in it. You'll have 30-day access to it, and we want you to use it with your students, especially during Black History Month. What you know, we I'm Black through three, you know, 24, 7, 365. But during the month of February, people feel more comfortable with it, all right? And so we want you to, to utilize it and then come back at the end of those 30 days and take a post survey just so that we can see uh, the impact that it may have had on you as well as the students that you used it with, okay? So I really wanna encourage you, uh, I wanna thank you all for, for tuning in and participating. And I wanna thank you in advance for your support because the work um, that, that I do um, is not, is, <laughs> is supported by hardworking black people on a teacher's salary, basically. So we don't get grants from Fortune 500 companies and things of that nature. Uh, and we self-publish our books intentionally because we believe it's important that we maintain control of the narrative of our history and our culture. So when you purchase our books or purchase our products, it helps us to keep the mission going. So I wanna thank you all for your time and attention. And I hope I've stayed within the time and I'm, I'm here for any questions that you may want to ask. I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. King. All right, let's give Dr. Kula a hand for that wonderful presentation. Send us some love in the chat and all that good stuff here. So we do have some questions. First, I want to see if we have any questions from the chat. Uh, Greg and Donovan and Montana, did, did you all see any questions um, in the chat for our, um, for our future nerd today? None. Okay. All right. Um, you all can unmute yourself if you would like to have um, to talk to um, Dr. Kua. I know I was going real fast trying to get it all in. There's so much more I wanted to share. Just go ahead and unmute and ask ask a question or your comment. I see one right here from. Hi. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, yes. Dr. Kua. How does this? a play into this critical race theory um, scenario where we need to teach black history? Like, can your information be put into the schools so that we get it from the ground up, you know, starting from second grade up, et cetera, or how does that play? Um, so a number of my resources are in, in public schools, public, private, and charter schools across the country and internationally. Of course, um, the, the 
manufactured crisis around CRT has a lot of administrators and teachers feeling like uh, like they're handcuffed. And so what you should notice about what I've shared with you is that it's culturally relevant. That's that's the language that I use. If someone wants to press me on CRT, um, I don't necessarily need critical race theory to teach the truth. Now, I understand critical race theory is a tremendous intellectual contribution because it was intended to center the views and the voices of Black people and other marginalized people whose voices had not previously been heard, okay? Uh, and it was also attempt to bring to light a lot of uh, historical and contemporary facts that were being intentionally buried, all right? Um, but critical race theory is a backlash against a right rising tide of emerging consciousness. People are waking up today. They're starting to challenge systems and structures that have been miseducating people for century, for decades and centuries. And so this is a huge backlash against that as people are waking up, so much so that in Florida, the, the law that they passed called Stop Woke, like that, that should tell you something. The fact that they called it the Stop Woke Act, that means they want you to stay asleep, right? They want you to stay asleep because people make multi-billions of dollars a year off of our ignorance, right? But I also tell young people, it's not enough to be woke. I'm sharing this with my sons. My sons are 20 and 22. You can be awake, but still be in the bed. But as Malcolm said, you got to wake up. You got to sit up. You got to stand up. You got to clean up and go to work for your people. So it's not enough to be woke. We got to go to work. And so it's incumbent upon us as conscious and committed educators to take a stand and teach the truth. Now, this is my 30th year in education. I've been doing this from, from the very beginning and ran into a lot of roadblocks. I tell people I was in the principal's office more than some of my troubled students because I was teaching things that were outside of the prescribed curriculum but I was getting results that others couldn't get. When they came to observe my class, my class was on task. They were on point, asking questions, answering questions. And oftentimes I was given some of the most challenging students that they couldn't handle. I'm a former teacher of the year. And so I had to make sure that I covered myself on all levels by demonstrating excellence because that's the ancestral standard. Um, so I hope that gives a little bit of insight into the, the whole thing behind CRT. It is going to take educators and leaders with tremendous moral courage to stand against this onslaught of, of, uh, of the backlash against CRT. All right. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Mr. Mr. Willis, go ahead. Definitely. Thank you, uh, Dr. King. Um, I definitely appreciate your presentation this morning. And you had made a fact or stated a fact that I was not aware of until today about hieroglyphics being a Greek word uh, being associated with the Meru Netcher. Um, my question for you is, Do you are you aware of any African sororities and fraternities that existed before um, what we now call Greek fraternities that African Americans prescribe to nowadays? You know, I'm going through the same issue right now with... Uh, being a Prince Hall Mason and, um, you know, having our Knights of Pythagoras, you know, be the title for our young men's group when we know that uh, Pythagoras did not, you know, invent his theory as well. So just do you have any knowledge around that that particular topic? So I'm going to start uh, with the last thing you said first. Uh, Pythagoras, we know from research literature that Pythagoras studied in ancient Kemet for 22 years. Um and instead of, uh, of calling it that, maybe it should be called the Knights of, of Imhotep or the Knights of Amos, who, you know, wrote the, the Amos Mathematics Papyrus. Um, in terms of fraternities, I do not know. Of, I, I'll say this. I, I attribute a great deal of what I know to from being initiated into the Brotherhood of Kemet Nu when I was an undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. The challenge with us then was uh, we could not get a... A charter from the university. So it was very difficult to keep it sustaining. 
Around that same time, Morehouse College had a male fraternity called Kemet. And I don't think they're still active, but some of those brothers, you know, still meet and, you know, many of them are elders now, by my age or older. Um, so it's, it's challenging. So one of the things um, that I like to do is I like to teach my students about these origins in particular, so that they'll know, even if they join a Greek letter organization, what the origins of them are. For example, when you go back to, and this is not an endorsement of any particular one, but of course the first one was Alpha Phi Alpha. And so if you go online for a Phi A, you, you're a Sphinxman, right? And the, the bust of King Tut is one of their main symbols. But most of the rituals in all of the black fraternities and sororities come out of um, the African initiation system, but many of them have been twisted. So in terms of the, the violence, the hazing, the drunkenness, the orgies, all that kind of stuff that's oftentimes attributed to fraternities and sororities, that's not our stuff. The higher sacred knowledge, the commitment, the organization, th that's our stuff. So when you look at the, the wonderful things that these organizations do, like we're in large measure um, responsible for the election of, a, of our current president and vice president, their ability to organize, to raise funds, to have uh, tutoring programs like yours does, all of those are very, very important. I just ask people to understand the difference between what has been uh, the alien cultural objectives that have been injected into our culture and separate that from our authentic culture. So I hope that gives some insights into your question. No, definitely. Thank you very much. I definitely appreciate your response and uh, gives me gives me some things to build on today. So appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Any questions in the chat, uh, Greg, Montana, uh, or Donovan? I see Elizabeth says where to even start. Um, that's why I've created the resources that I have. So you can start with uh, one of my books, um, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations or Education for Transformation. You can also start with Reading Revolution Online. Um, but the key thing is to start. That's the key. I specifically wrote my books so that they're scholarly enough to be uh, uh scholarly enough to be recognized, but practical enough to be utilized. So I, I avoided lofty language that separates me from my intended audience. I wanted it to be easy enough to read, but also scholarly in its orientation. Um, so that's why I think that these books are a great place to start because I wanted to create a bridge between uh, this knowledge and some of the more difficult books to read that are in the research literature. So that would be a great place to start. In addition, you can look up some of my videos on uh, YouTube as well. So I have not question, gone Elizabeth. through oh, okay. your site yet and looked at your resources. So I'm wondering, do you have like uh, textbooks or, or resources that you would consider to be um, curricular supplements and the grade levels that you would recommend them for use? Yes, so Reading Revolution, as I said, began as a book, but then we created the online version of it, which is much more expansive than the book was, okay? And so Reading Revolution Online is really for uh, grades about four through 10, grades four through 10. Uh, we're working on a primary edition for it, um, but we don't have that just yet. When you go to readingrevolution.org and click on books by Akua, you'll see a variety of books for different grade levels. You'll see uh, my son wrote a book about his first trip to the motherland. It's called My First Trip to the Motherland. And that would be for your primary grades. Okay. We have a book called uh, A Treasure Within, Stories of Remembrance and Rediscovery. That's helpful in the primary grades uh, as well on up into middle school. Okay. We have a couple of books called Words of Power, volume one and two. Each one contains uh, 200 to 250 quotes and proverbs that share a lot of that mother wit and wisdom that we may have received growing up, but that 
any of our children are not. Um, so what we've attempted to do, all of these are resources that I've created over the years. I've written 11 books um, in order to fill in the gaps of what I saw was missing from public school curricula. And let me say also missing from private school curricula. A lot of times our uh, parents, conscientious parents will say, well, I, my student, my, my child's not going to get what they need from the public school system. Let me send them to this private school. Guess what? You get to pay even more for your miseducation because they're not going to have it there either. So this is why it's so important. And I'm in, I have the dubious task of trying to reach parents and students on the one hand, but teachers and leaders on the other. So I can't wait for school systems to get a clue. So I also have to try to go directly to the parents and say, hey, y'all need to get these things as well and start working with your children at home. Uh, but hey, it's it's a challenge, but we are up for the challenge. That's that's what we're here for. So thank you for that question, Christina. Did I did I answer your question or do you have another one? You definitely did. And so I'm a curriculum coordinator. So if I'm looking for resources, um, and I know you spoke to me online, are there any like samples that I would be able to get? Is that just going on here and and um, placing the request for info? Right. So when you go to readingrevolution.org you can put your email address in and actually uh, receive a brief demo. Or if you want to get some of your colleagues together and get in contact with me, I'd be glad to uh, walk you all through a brief demo uh, online. Because uh, as I said, there's some things I didn't get a chance to share you, with you all. I just put in the chat box again, the brief survey to take to, to gain free 30 day. I'm sorry, I should have put 30 day, 30 day free access. Uh, to uh, to Reading Revolution Online. But if you wanna get some of your colleagues together, I can walk you through and show you the different activities, the reading comprehension, vocabulary uh, development, the grammar and writing skills. Um, and it's all housed on that platform where you can literally upload your class roster into the system. And the student, the parent, and the teacher can track that child's progress across all 90 reading selections, all reading comprehension activities, all the vocabulary activities, everything. So it's a tremendous resource that we have spent considerable time working on and really proud of. And by the way, we were just honored to be in Black Enterprise, featured in Black Enterprise Magazine uh, about a week and a half ago for what we're doing. All right. Um, Demetrius, what you got? Good morning, good morning, brother. TK, I really appreciate your presentation this morning. It's very powerful. I just wanted to say hi to you, man, and congratulate you for standing in the, in the uh, struggle for so long. I was a graduate of Morehouse College in 2002, and Command Asin was still active then. Uh, they actually showed the film Ethnic Notions, and that's something that opened up my mind to how multimedia can be used to create these myths and, and teach us these myths about ourselves, our history, our heritage, and our abilities as a people. In 2006, we crossed paths uh, with the Dessert Club tour in Egypt. So I appreciate you. And I just want to say thank you and keep up the great work. Oh, wonderful. Tell me your name again, brother. Quite cool, Demetrius Hobson. Oh, wow. So you were on one of our trips to Egypt? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Great, great to link back up. Oh, that's awesome. And did you say when you were at Morehouse that uh, Kemet was still in effect there, the Brotherhood? Yeah, that was 2002. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah, man, that's powerful. Well, it's, it's good to see you and glad to see that you're still about the work as well. Yes, sir. All right. All right. So we're going to start winding down. Um, do we have any last comments or questions or anything like that? I did see um, someone wanted a part two. Uh, so, um, um, I'll, uh, make sure we have a part two after this round of nerds and, and uh, maybe we can, uh, have them come back for, you know, you know, next year in terms of our nerd session. Um, but, um, I know Dr. Ku is always all around, uh, please give them your contact information, any social media or anything like that. I know he just, just put it in the chat there um any other questions or comments or thoughts as we uh begin to leave because some of y'all need need, need to flow uh, um fold that laundry up i know 
any short synaps synopsis or that you can give us on helping this mental health issue? More and more young people are committing suicide, especially young males. Um, I'm just frustrated about that. Would some of this also help that? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, one of our books, uh, Treasure Within, would be helpful with that. Uh, Treasure Within is a book of three short stories in which young people have encounters with ancient African ancestors to learn about uh, their original history, culture, morals, and values. But they're surrounded by, the, the children in the stories are surrounded by adults who help them to navigate through the challenges that all young people face, especially situations of peer pressure, um, situations of potential violence, um, situations of uh, recovering from the loss of a loved one. And so there's a workbook that goes with it that allows the teacher to explore some of these different things about decision-making, thoughts, social, emotional learning, and so forth. So I would recommend the book, uh, A Treasure Within for that. Um, but even more so, um, one of the things that we found is that a number of our children have been traumatized being in racially isolated settings where they're one of only a few uh, black children or children of color. And what we found is that when they're in settings with children who look like them, who are uh, learning this type of rich historical cultural knowledge, that it, it boosts their, their self-esteem, their cultural esteem tremendously. Now, for a more particular person who specializes in social emotional learning, I can't recommend enough uh, Tierica Berry. So you can go to a woman's standard.com, a woman's standard, woman with an S, a woman's standard.com. Um, Tierica Berry is our social emotional learning specialist at Teacher Transformation Institute. And she's absolutely amazing at what she does in terms of leading uh, professional development for teachers and leaders, um, small group, uh, social emotional learning groups for children, as well as uh, larger group presentations for them. Uh, she's amazing at what she does. And I'm, I'm so proud to say that she's actually one of my former students. I taught her when she was in uh, seventh grade, but I like to let people know um, that her brilliance is all her own. She's just amazing at what she does. So that's a woman's standard. No apostrophe S. So I mean, let me right here. Uh, a woman's standard.com. Yeah, so you can uh, get in contact with her for specialized training in social emotional learning. But I believe that all teachers and all leaders should have that kind of knowledge to be able to connect with our children. So very important. And I agree with you um, that that's something that we need to be very, very mindful of. All right. All right. So last last yeah. time, let's give him a real good hand here uh, for coming and um, uh, blessing us with uh, so much um, you know, knowledge as well as resources. And uh, please reach out um for those all right so again just 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 reminding everybody if, if 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 you're interested in being part of the teaching black history conference as a presenter please get those proposals in proposals are due the first saturday of march but uh please get them in as soon as possible uh please put that website in the chat again um guys thank you um uh make make sure to take the brief surf uh, uh survey for the um for the um reading revolution uh program 30 days there um that's that's a big time blessing uh for people um here um and what else next week we have dr amanda vickery coming in um talking about uh fanny Lou hamer um and we are really really excited about that also uh, if you haven't seen, um, you know, again, this is the third year that I have uh, co-edited uh, a, a special Black History Month um, edition. 
uh, in Education Week. Uh, Greg, I think, just sent the link out. Um, there's there's some beautiful written articles about the urgency of Black history. Um, uh, the Staff Center, we wrote about our favorite Black history resources. So if, if you're interested about those different resources, please uh, gain access to that. And then plus there's, there's um, I have my article that deals with building Black history programs. What are those particular steps? Uh, Brittany Jones has notions of Black fear. Winter Johnson has an article on um, Black history needs to be in elementary spaces. And then um, Ishmael Jimenez has his piece on how African um, studies can save the world. Um, so uh, please go there um, and and do that. So each year we'll have our Black History Month aspect for Education Week, which has a subscription base over um, the 1.6 million uh, people. So, all right, having said all that, good, ha happy Black History Month. Good Saturday. We love to have you here. Thank you again. Um, and we'll see y'all next week. <laughs>